because we're going to take a look at the, the part of the story that controls your whole life. There's a specific part that if you shift that part of your story, it changes. It'll change everything. In fact, we're going to share with you today how you create lasting change. Because I've had a lot of people say, I've lost 100 pounds, 10 pounds, 10 times, the same 10 pounds, right? You know? Or people say to me, yeah, I'm on day seven of, you know, stop smoking. I'm like, why are you counting? So you can tell me how many days you lasted before you went back, right? When you make a shift the way I'm going to show you today, it's a permanent shift. And you'll see it's true because I'm not asking you to believe anything I'm saying. I want you to start your own experience. And you'll see, you'll know it's true. But I just some of the stories that were really touching, I saw one of the stories I read was this uh, woman who, at 15, she was abducted and enslaved and she was trafficked and somehow she managed to get herself out of that. But by 18, she had two children and by 24, she was a widow. But she found a way to change that story. That's not from something we did. She just shared all the ways she broke through and you know, now she's the number one person in real estate in her area and she's married to a man that's a 20 year veteran and just this beautiful life because she was able, in, yeah, give it up for her in spite of all that to change her story, right? It's beautiful. Um, you know, I was touched by, there was an African-American gentleman from Chicago that I saw there, sir, and I'm not remembering your name, but I remember the experience. He was just so authentic. He's, he's a single father of two boys, and he's been in the military, and he's had this belief, I just can't. I just can't provide for my boys. I can't provide the opportunities. I can't provide what they deserve. And then you just feel this shift in him when it's like, because he's got a reason. And, and I want to mention this to you. You'll stay stuck in your, in your pain and your problem until you have something you value more than your pain and your problem. Remember we mentioned that yesterday? Well, the thing that he valued in this case is his boys, and you could just see the shift in him, like right there on camera. It's like, no, you know, it's, I am enough. I'm enough. I can make this happen. I will make this happen. And the strength in his voice and his face, and his, you just can't fake that. So now what you got to do is condition it so it sticks around, and that's what I'm going to show you a little bit how to do today. And one more, just there's so many. Uh, another one was um, a woman who was from Australia who, uh, when she was a young girl, she was in a boating accident, and both her parents and her brother died. And so then she had what they call survivor's guilt, like I should have died. And, and that became her belief. I should have died too. I, I shouldn't be here. And then what happens when you believe something like that? It controls your whole life. You're like, I'm not worthy. I don't deserve life. I don't deserve health. I don't deserve abundance. I don't deserve relationship. And the shift in her was just spectacular. How many of you were inspired by people's other stories, not just your own being shifted there, some of us, right? So please, each day, the purpose of the challenge, again, there's no charge for it. Here's the charge, do something. I really want to see your life change. I may never see you again. I'd love to have you in an event if you want to come, but I don't have some agenda here. I just want to serve you. We're five days of just giving everything we can to you. We're in really rough times. The rough times are not forever. And by the way, I'll tell you something about rough times before I forget. If you study the history of the world, you will see there are patterns, there are seasons, as I mentioned the other day. There's springtime when everything seems to be easy and optimistic. There's summer when it's a bit hard and you gotta push through. Then there's the reaping time, right, of autumn where you get all the beauty. And then what follows the reaping time is winter again. And sometimes you think winter is going to be forever. When things are going good, you think it's going to go good forever. When you think it's going bad, it's going bad forever. So we're kind of in a winter time, meaning the overall attitudes are more fear and uncertainty, right? And it's probably going to go on for another four, five, six, seven years where that doesn't have to be your life. You have to learn how to ski or snowboard in the winter, right? Build the fire, build your business, grow. Do well in this season, all the other seasons are easy. You'll continue to dominate. So this is the season you build muscle from. That's how you get strong. But if you look at history, you see some, a pattern that's immutable. And that is good times create weak people. Because when there's no challenge, we don't grow. There's a generation of people right now that have been raised, and it's not their fault, and it's not all of a generation, but there's a generation of people right now that have had everything at their fingertips instantly, pretty much for free, and they don't understand. A lot of them are so unhappy. You see more suicides, more drug overdoses in this generation than any his generation in history. I'm talking about combination primarily at this point of the Z generation, and I feel for them because they haven't had the challenge and they don't realize life is demanding I become more. We're being called. If you're only doing things to meet your own needs, it's pretty easy to survive, especially in this world today. 
pretty easy to distract yourself. All you got is a phone or a computer, and you're going to let hours go by scrolling stuff, right? I mean, that's the world is, but you're not going to be happy or fulfilled. That's why these people just don't have that meaning. Now, not all of them, thank God, but a huge number of them, a huge number of them live a fearful life. If you have a different belief than I do, then you're evil. I stand away from you versus let me understand what you believe. I may disagree, but we can agree to disagree, and we can still be friends. That generation has been taught something different. And again, it's not their fault. They've been conditioned. And millennial generation, many of you in this room are millennial generation, this virtual room around the world, you've had some of that too. And some of your X generation, you're a little more pragmatic because you were raised in a totally different environment, right? You had to fend for yourselves, figure it out. Some of you are baby boomers and you know, you have this great mission. So every generation is raised a certain way by your parents. Now everyone's different individually, but collectively, if you study history, there's a book you might want to read. It's called Generations. I was, when I was working with President Clinton, I left his office, this is how different the world is today, of coaching him, and I went across to Speaker Gingrich, who was Republican, Democrat and Republican, the head of the, the House and the President of the United States. I coached them both on the same day. And today, somebody would shoot you in the head if you talked to the other side. It's just so <laughs> ridiculous, right? And what was interesting is on both their desks was this book, Generations. And Clinton told me it was one of the best books he read. It's the story of 500 years of Anglo-American history. And it shows how generations are raised. Not you. You might be different than your generation. You probably are. But how that affects the entire way we respond to challenges. And it affects history. And how then that generation reacts differently in the way they raise their kids. And so it's fascinating. So here's what the pattern I want you to know. Good times create weak people because we're not challenged. Weak people create bad times. But here's the good news. Bad times create strong people. You know, the greatest generation in American history, we call them the great generation or the greatest generation, is that World War II generation. But they were treated like, and they were seen like Z generation to older people or millennials, young millennials, because they, they, they just, it was about, you know, what they wanted and they wanted things on their terms. And what am I getting? That was the perception and not enough work ethic. And, oh, they all want everything their way and they're not here to contribute. They call it contribution, but it's the stuff that's easy, right? It's positioning. And if you were born in 1910, just to give you an idea, the people born in 1910, those children grew up in their first 20 years with unbelievable abundance. They saw us win World War I. They saw us turn around so much. They all this technology, radio and television and cars. And they dreamed of parties. They were called flappers. They were weak. They were, they were looked down on. But guess what? When they turned 19 and thought they were gonna have a car and party, it was 1929 and the whole world was going through the floor. So their story was shaped by the history they're in. And they had to fight through watching people jumping out of buildings. He lived in the Midwest, the Dust Bowl, people in bread lines. And he made it through 10 years of the Depression, only to turn 29 in 1939 when Hitler invades, you know, Poland and Czechoslovakia and starts bombing London. And we're not, none of us were alive at that time, but the ones that were will tell you it looked like the world was going to end. And they went and fought the war and they came back and they became strong. So bad times create strong people. And here's the final chapter, strong people create great times. That generation came back and changed this country. They created the late 40s, 50s, and early 60s before Kennedy was shot. And then history changes again. So I want you to know that it, a lot of you have had bad times, me too. I don't waste time telling everybody all of them. I could bore you with hours of all the suffering that I've gone through, but I don't spend any time there because spend time there would just make me weaker. It's what I, where I've really grown is from those times. And all the stories that you saw, if you read them, the, the toughest stories, it's like if you watch a movie, the quality of the hero is completely shaped by how strong the villain is. You know, if I went way back in history and you think of seeing Anthony Hopkins as Hannibal Lecter and Jodie Foster, and he's so brilliant, he's so intense. That's what makes her such a great hero because she has to deal with this crazy, intense, brilliant, powerful, all-powerful being. You become more. So one thing that I've tried to do with the story of my life is it, it's gotten better and better. It takes more to knock me off at this stage because i built more muscle, right? But I look, when something happens, if it starts to get me, I go, ah, a worthy opponent. <laughs> We all need a worthy opponent. Sometimes the opponent's inside you, conflict in you, you know what I mean? Or sometimes it seems like it's an outside person. Sometimes it's an intimate. But 
if something's getting you, there's something in you that needs to grow. And that's what the story really provides. So I just want to start by saying thank you. Thank you for playing full out. Thank you for giving your all. Thank you for sharing because you're inspiring other people and you're inspiring yourself. Give a hand to everybody that's participating in making this happen so far. So let's do just a two-second review at the highest level, 30,000 feet. So yesterday, we talked about a lot of things, but one of the things we talked about was this idea of the most basic principle of change is energy. And I know it sounds so basic and fundamental, but it's so important because when you realize it intellectually, it doesn't do anything, but when you realize it physically, it changes everything. Meaning, if there's a pattern in you, if there's a habit, if that habit could be an emotional habit, it could be a pattern of thinking, I'm not enough, I can't make this happen, or, you know, I don't know why this happened to me, or, you know, this person did this to me, instead of finding the good in it, that all happens at low levels of energy. When you're at a higher level of energy, it's like, like we said, like if you're totally in love, everything is great, right? That's a real high frequency of energy. So if you're gonna dislodge an old pattern, you're gonna need to do it with more energy. And that's why if you see me in a normal seminar, we're going 12 hours a day, but it doesn't feel like 12 hours, why? Because a minute feels like eternity. Like if I said to you, how long is a long time? Well, a minute feels like eternity if you're not having a good time or if you're in pain. You're right? But hours go by and it feels like minutes if you're in, engaged and involved. And one of the things we do is use your body to generate that energy. So even though we're in this kind of calm environment here, it's not the whole studio, and I'm sitting more, I want you to remember that if you're not getting the result you want, it's time to increase your energy. And the way to do that is through movement and sound. The way you move, the way you breathe, the way you use your voice, all that can instantly change the energy in your body, regardless of how much sleep you have or don't have, or how much you've eaten or not eaten. That is the force that changes you. And you know it. How many have had an experience where something stimulated you, you were still exhausted and tired, and boom, you're up all night? Who knows what I'm talking about here? Make some noise if you have that experience, right? So we want to consciously use that same tool within ourselves. If there's something you want to change, we've got to bring more energy to it. We also talked about yesterday this whole idea of not getting stuck in what I call the tyranny of how. Remember we said, you know, how do you create a breakthrough? How do we get to that moment where everything changes? And by the way, we had some great examples yesterday. I wrote down Christina and Jason. Remember them yesterday, Christina, with her child after three and a half years? Boy, she, how many of you are moved by her story? Incredible story, right? And Jason, too, leaving his family, you know, being a victim and coming back a victor and turning things around and taking responsibility. You know, she's saying that, you know, the real pain would be to never had my child and have those three and a half years of beauty. And now she's vesting herself in a child she's adopted. And you could feel her sincere joy. You can't fake that. So we can change everything in our lives with enough energy. We can change everything in our lives if we don't get stuck on the how. And so that's why we learned strategy, story, state, which really is state first if you want to change your life. If you want to make progress, you've got to change your state. Then you absolutely need a better story that's going to empower you. And then you'll find the strategy or you'll make up a strategy to make it work. Otherwise, if you start with strategy and you don't believe because you've never done it before, you go, how do I do this? You don't even know how. You've got to first get the first pieces in place and you'll figure out the how. And then yesterday, how many found value in finding different parts of yourself if you got stuck that have different answers with archetypes we did yesterday? Did you enjoy that? Good, good, good. So today, all the things we talked about yesterday, your story is a combination of your beliefs. And your beliefs shape everything. Uh, and, but there's one specific kind of belief that's most important. Like, what is most important to you, what you believe is most important to you is what you value. Your values shape your life. So there's many different types of beliefs. But today I want to share with you the belief that controls everything in your life. It controls how you think, how you feel, what you do, what you experience, what you won't do. And that is what we call your identity. Your identity. Now what is identity? We all have a way of defining ourselves. Remember when you just your story and I said, you know, what role were you playing in this story? You know, something was I was being a victim, you know, and I'm becoming a victor. That's a radical change, right? Are you the person that's, you know, are you the one trying to please all the time? Are you the overachiever, right? Are you the pawn? Are you the chess piece or the chess player? Whatever your metaphors are for life shape you. 
So I want you to write down a little phrase, first of all. Write down, beliefs create and beliefs destroy. Please jot it down right in front of you in big letters that stands out for you. Every belief you have either creates or destroys. And the problem is most of us are not conscious of the beliefs that we have. And Unleashed Power Within, we do a four-hour process where we find the three most limiting beliefs of your life and literally annihilate them. When I say annihilate them, get them out of your body and then replace them with things. And I don't tell you what to do. You pick them. They're different for everybody. But then replace them with new beliefs that change you because the only thing stopping you usually is an inner conflict. If you got enough energy, if you know what you want and you got the right tools, the problem is you want to sleep to noon and be a billionaire. That's a conflict, right? You know, you want everybody to be happy and tell the truth. That's a conflict, right? Because not everybody's going to be happy when you tell the truth. And so those conflicts cause us to take two step forwards and three step back. I'm going to be totally successful, but I don't want anybody ever judge me. Well, in the world we're in today, people love to judge anybody for any reason, right? It's absurd. In fact, if I ask you a question, I want to know your answer, and I want you to put it in the chat for me. What do you think most people would rather be today? Happy or outraged? Which one do you think most people would focus on, spend more time in today? Happy or outraged? Outraged. 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 Happy. Outraged. 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 Happy. Outraged. Outraged. Out. Yeah. Most people rather be outraged because when you're outraged, you feel some energy in your body. When you're outraged, you feel significant, but it doesn't feed your soul. So your beliefs, whatever they are, either make you outraged or make you happy. And your beliefs, what is a belief, by the way? Let's put down a definition for you because we keep using it like we know what it is. Write down, if you would, a belief is nothing but a sense of absolute certainty. A belief is nothing but a feeling of absolute certainty about what something means. When you're absolutely certain about what something means, you have a belief. You might believe you're sexy or you might believe you're not sexy. You might believe you're really smart. You might feel, I'm not that smart. You might believe you're worthy or not worthy, but all you're really saying is, I feel certain about this. Can I tell you the good news? All feelings can be changed in a moment by a radical change in your focus, in your language, and in the way you use your body. You can be from, I'm uncertain to certain, and change it literally that fast when you know how to do it with your body. And I'm going to show you how to do that today. So everything is controlled by your beliefs. So let's take a sample. Let's say if you're a pawn, then what's life like? <laughs> you are at the effect of everything. You're the victim, right? What if you think, like, if I asked you right now, what is life? What's life? Give me your definition of life. The first thing that pops in your mind, put it in the chat, just for a second, if you don't mind. I'd love to see what you say. Just don't, don't, don't try to make it perfect. Just first gut response. What is life? What is life? Okay, I'm seeing here. There's a little delay. Okay, there we go. So I'm getting all kinds of different metaphors. So let me offer you a few here. And then you tell me, why don't you put this in the chat instead? It'll be even easier. If life, some people say to me, life is a battle. And that's their belief. Well, if you believe life is a battle, that affects everything in your life. Is that going to affect your relationships and the way you deal with relationships, intimate relationships, your kids, your work, your coworkers? Absolutely. When you believe life's a battle, tell me what life's like. Put it, if you would, put it right now in the chat so I can see. If life's a battle, what's life like? Okay, good. It's a war. (laughs) Somebody wins and somebody loses. It's a struggle. It's horrible. It's hard. You get hurt. Okay, it's exhausting, it's painful, good, it's total stress. Okay, so if you have that metaphor, and by the way, a lot of people develop beliefs without even realizing you get around somebody you care about, and gradually, maybe you like somebody's music, rock and roll days, and you love their music, and they're constantly getting high on heroin, you're like, oh man, if I had heroin, I'd be a great musician too, right? And for some reason, it doesn't work out that way for you, right? But people dress like that person, don't they? And they take on their beliefs sometimes. I remember years and years ago, I played when I was a young guy. I used to play poker with these guys. And one of my buddies, you know, three of my buddies were older and they were married. And one of my buddies uh, used to always say, oh, I got to go, guys, man, I got to go. You know, I got to get back to the old ball and chain. And that's what he called his wife. Right? Can you imagine what, how he's going to interact with her when that's his belief? That's the words he uses. Those words affect the way the biochemistry in you. They affect the way you think, feel, and act. They're a belief. Your words create beliefs. And so I remember one day when one of the other guys who really loves his wife always talked about it on the highest levels, go, yeah, I got to get back to my ball and chain too. And I remember thinking at the time, <laughs> he's infecting him. 
Because after a while, you can pick up things you don't even notice. How many know what I'm talking about here? How many are aware of this, right? You know? Uh, my, my fourth father, Jim Robbins, I remember he'd come home and the door would slam and we'd all pause to hear. Because he had this weird thing he did. He'd come home, cl- close the door. If it was a good day, he'd go, monkey gurus. I still don't know what the hell that means. But we knew he was in a great state, and we all came around. But if he wasn't in a monkey guru state, and look, when I had my first kids, my first boy and, and, you know, I adopted, I was like, I came home, and I, shortly thereafter, I did, hey, monkey gurus. I don't, where the hell does that shit come from, right? <laughs> so it starts to affect you even when you don't know it. So, but what if life, if it's not a battle, what if life is a test? Tell me what life's like. Type it in real quick. If you believe life is a test, then what's it like? It's a challenge. Um, it's going to be painful because I'm not good at tests. Okay, that's good. It's going to be stressful. Someone else is grading me. I'm being judged. Interesting, right? You can pass or fail, right? Someone else says it's a nice opportunity. So it changes how you look at life. What if life was, what if you thought life was sacred? Then what's life? Put it down in the notes there. What's life if it's sacred? And life is what? special, it's precious, it's a blessing, it's cherished, it's open, it's peaceful, it's a privilege, it's magnificent. By the way, do you feel a different energy when you say, you know, life is a gift? What if life's a gift? What's life like? What would you say if life's a gift? Oh, it could be a surprise, it could be fun, it's beautiful, I love gifts, (laughs) I love to give gifts, it's treasured. What if life is a dance? What's life like if it's a dance? Oh, it's exciting. It's fun. I do it with others. You're not alone. You can do it alone or with others. It's joyous. It's playful, sexy, whimsical, an adventure. So let me ask you a question. What is, which one is right? Is life a battle? Is it a test? Right? Is it, you know, a, a dance? Is it a party? Is it sacred? And many of you say it's all those things. And that would be true, except that's not how your brain works. Life is whatever you've decided to believe about it. Because once you think life's a battle, you will find brown everywhere, even if it's beige, even if it's a different color. How many follow what I'm talking about here? Say I. I. Say I. I. So we have to be so conscious about our beliefs because they literally change our life. Remember I said yesterday, we don't experience life. We experience the life we focus on. How many of you have something in your life right now that if you focused on it, you could feel really, really Grateful. How many got something you can feel really grateful for or someone you can feel grateful for? Yeah. How many of you if how many of you got shit that you could be pissed off or stressed about if you wanted to be by focusing on it? So So we don't experience life, we experience what life we focus on, and our habits are focused or controlled by our beliefs, and now let's go a step deeper. But there's one belief that's more powerful than all the rest, and it is your identity. Because once you define yourself, I want you to write this down. We're going to put it on the screen as well. This is so important. When I learned this about human beings, I started being able to help people I could never help before and create lasting change. Because lasting change only happens when you change or improve your identity. You might want to jot that down. Lasting change comes, it requires a change or an upgrade of your identity. It doesn't have to be a change. It might just be an upgrade. It might be an improvement. So what What is the power of identity? Let's write this on the screen for you here. Here's what identity is. Write down this. Identity is the most powerful force, put it on the screen for everybody, that influences every thought, feeling, and emotion in your life because we need to be consistent with it. Guys, can you throw it up on the screen, please? The strongest force, write it down in your notes, the strongest force in anybody's personality, in a human personality, is the need to stay consistent with how we define ourselves. That's why identity is so powerful. I'll say it again, jot it down. The strongest force in your personality, in mine, any human's personality, is the need to stay consistent with how we define ourselves. Now, what the heck does that mean? It means that if you define yourself as a person, I'll, I'll give you an example. I'm a procrastinator. If you say, I'm a procrastinator enough, let's say you had a goal, you had a dream, and you're gonna go for it, and then the last minute, you get stressed, your fear of failing, and you don't do it, you put it off. People put things off because it's either not that important, they don't want it that bad, or they associate negative feelings to it, right? So you put it off because you're a little fearful or uncertain. And then you go, no, I gotta do this, and you get yourself riled up, gonna do it, and the last minute, you don't follow through again. After three or four times of this, your brain's gonna go, I don't wanna feel disappointed all the time. 
So it's going to change your identity or you go, I'm a procrastinator. Now that you're a procrastinator, you will procrastinate because who you are. You need to stay consistent with who you are. You won't get your dreams or goals, but you will have certainty that life will not be that up and down because you won't have the disappointments. How many understand what I'm talking about here? If it makes sense, make some noise. I know you're getting it. So once we define ourselves a certain way, it controls and shapes what we do and what we won't do. And by the way, write that down. How we know who we are is by who we are and who we're not. Some of you, like, for example, if we start getting up and jumping around and clapping, going, I'm not one of those, (laughs) you know? I wasn't either, but I learned to be one of those so I could use my nervous system and be in charge, right? Because otherwise there's not enough nervous energy in your body to follow through. So, but that's how we do things. I'm not one of those. I'll give you an example. If who here has ever smoked cigarettes or cigars or something for a long period of time, Struggle, but you finally quit and you've not gone back. Who's done this? You suck cigarettes, doesn't anymore. Make some noise if you did that. Fantastic. Congratulations. So if I came to you now, the person that doesn't smoke, hasn't smoked in five or ten years, and I said, hey, would you like a cigarette? Would you say, what brand is it? (laughs) No, what would you say? Tell me what you'd say. You'd say, put in the chat, what would you say? So I know. That's right. What would you say? I'm not a smoker. I'm not one of those. That's why you don't smoke anymore. See, when people say, I'm on day seven of stopping smoking, I know they're going to go back. They're counting the days because they haven't shifted their identity yet. So they're trying to build up and say, you know, I lasted longer this time. How many understand what I'm talking about here? If this makes sense, make a little noise so I know I'm getting through to you. Thank you. I just want to know because I'm watching your faces, but I can't see all of you, right? So I'm just seeing in the comments as well. So I, I get to a little bit of feedback there. I just want to make sure I'm reaching you on this because it's so important, okay? So when you change identity, it's not hard to have your behavior change. If you become a health nut, I'm making it up, you're you know, a fitness competitor, you're a person that just won't settle for less than you can be or do, those identity changes are going to change whether or not, for example, you drink alcohol to excess or not, or at all. It'll shift it and won't even be difficult if the identity changes strong enough. So changing identity controls how we think, how we feel, what we're willing to do, what we're not willing to do, and here's the challenge. When did you come up with your identity, your current definition of yourself that you're needing to stay consistent with? Probably wasn't in the last six months. Most people, that definition themselves came from 10, 20, 30 years ago. In the people's stories that I read, So many of you, your old story is based on identity as something happened when you were 15 or 20 or 25 or 30, and now you've stacked all that to today, so you think that's who you are, as opposed to that's what I experienced, and now I'm who I am is more than I experienced. How many of you somewhere in your soul know there's an immutable part of you that's more than anything that could ever happen to you? How many feel that? Make some noise if you know that's true. Strong. That's like identity of soul. We get, we, sometimes we get caught up in the identity of the mind. And the mind has its limitations. The mind, by the way, will never make you happy. I, I've learned to use my mind as a tool. And I'm proud of my mind. It's a good mind. I develop it. I reward it. But I direct my mind. Because otherwise, your mind will direct you. And your mind will never make you happy, by the way. It will figure things out. It will do strategies. But it won't even allow you to enjoy an apple. Because it will go, is it organic or not? <laughs> You know, it's just, that's what the mind does. It divides, it separates. But the soul and spirit, the heart of you, that deeper identity is where all the joy and happiness and progress can make. So you are not who you've been as long as you stop accepting that as your definition of yourself. Is is this making sense? So if we think about it, think about it from the perspective of like, okay, if I want to make a shift, let's think of it as a metaphor. If if right now in your room, wherever you're staying, wherever you're staying, you have air conditioning. And let's say we sent the air conditioning at, say, 71 degrees, okay? And that 71 degrees represents your comfort zone, what makes you comfortable, all right? Now, let's take that beyond just physical comfort. Let's make that a metaphor. 71 degrees is the metaphor for how much love you're comfortable giving and receiving without you going, oh, this feels a little scary, right? Or let's say 71 degrees is not your goal financially, but it's where you live financially. It's like your comfort zone. It's like, I I want more, but I'm used to this, right? 
So I set it at, we'll use 68 degrees. Somebody's got a little visual for me they can throw up. Okay, good. So let's say 68 degrees is that metaphor, right? So at 68 degrees, we're going to be in a position where this is what life feels like. And let's say 68 degrees is like how much success you have in your life. 68 degrees is not where your body want, where you want to be for your body. It's not your goals. It's where you live. It's where you always come back to. Even if you lose weight, you come back to that 68 degrees. Who knows what I'm talking about here? If it makes sense, again, let's hear a little noise from you out there. Thank you. So now, what happens if you have this identity of being a 68 degree even though you want more, you don't usually get more because this is who I am. If you get more, it's temporary and you come back. Who's experienced this in your own life so you know what I'm talking about here? All right? But what happens if... All of a sudden, the temperature in your life drops down to a level you really don't like that's not consistent with your identity. You lose a bunch of money. You don't do as well at work. Your relationship starts breaking down. Your kids start talking back. You're getting fatter. Something like, and you find yourself at 63, 62, 59, 58 degrees. What's going to happen if you got that heater air conditioner in there? It's going to go, hey, hey, hey. You're a 68 degree, what are you doing here at 58? And you're gonna feel pressure. The heaters are gonna kick on and drive you to get yourself back up to where you need to be. How many of you have ever been in a situation where it got bad enough that finally your brain went, no more, and you kick back up to your identity? How many have done this before here? Say, I. Okay, here's what people don't realize. It happens on the upside too. What if you're in business, you're in life, you're in your career, you're in whatever, and things get better than you expect. And your relationship, you fall in love with somebody and it seems so good and it gets better and better and it goes 68, 78, 88. Or you're in business for yourself or you're in sales or whatever and your sales go up or your business grows and grows and you're doing better and better financially. And or you finally lose weight and you're getting better and better and it's like you've never been here before and then all of a sudden here you are, you're at 98, you're not 60. And then something in your brain goes, hey, 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 what the hell are you doing up here? You're not a 98 degree here, you're a 68 degree here. And then what happens? The heaters stop. You lose your drive. Now you start shopping instead of selling, right? Now you do a bunch of stupid stuff instead of run your business, right? Now you go, well, I'm already, I'm a 98 degree here now, I can have some cookies for God's sakes, right? And then it leads to the whole thing of haagen right? And then if the, if the heat of the drive is no longer there to grow, on top of it, air conditions will kick in to bring you right back down, and you'll start to sabotage till you get back to not bad necessarily, but not what you're truly capable of. It's what you've gotten used to, to your identity. How many of you have experienced this on both pendulums, up and down? How many experienced this? Make some noise if you've experienced both there. So if you think about this, if you want to change your life, you have to expand your identity. Does that make sense? You've got to be able to create that I'm a 98 degree. And some of you started to do that with your story last night. But we can do it even more powerfully if we understand a couple principles that I'm gonna give you today and we're gonna to practice today. They're really fun and easy. But it's just understanding that power. Let me give you a metaphor. Uh, Lance Armstrong is kind of a loaded name now because one of the greatest athletes of the generation, but he also doped up, right? He used these drugs. Um, but you know, that was years ago, he's changed. I know Lance, I've met him, he's a great guy. Um, but why? Why did he do that? Well, he also, besides winning more Tour de France than anybody in history and doping, and unfortunately a, a bunch of his contemporaries, competitors were doping. That was his rationalization as well. But it was against the rules. But he broke the rules. Why? Because his identity is, I always find the way to victory. I always find the way to victory. And you know what? It saved his life. Because if you remember, Lance Armstrong was diagnosed with cancer. One day he goes in and the doc says, you're terminal. You have cancer in your lungs, you have cancer in your brain, and you have cancer in your testicles, which is really an uncomfortable place if you ride a bike for a living on top of it, right? <laughs> and Lance, most people, some, someone says you're terminal, most people start arranging their affairs, their, nervous, their energy drops through the floor, they start to die in that moment because they believe that. But Lance had this core belief identity. I always find the way he goes, no, I'm not dying. I don't care what they say. There's got to be a solution. He started doing everything he could possibly do. And most of you know, he cured himself of cancer. So at work there, he broke all the rules there. He was rewarded for it. But 
in society, obviously, there's rules in the sport, and he broke those, and it cost him a bit of his identity, at least as an athlete. But understand, that's how powerful identity is. Identity can change whether you make it from cancer or not. And by the way, I, wrote, I read some stories of people like cancer and beat it, and one woman was describing how they were giving these drugs, and she said, I felt so terrible. I was breaking down. I stopped doing the drugs, and I'm feeling stronger and healthier, and you can see I got all my hair, and I'm better than I've ever been. Right? It was pretty beautiful. Yeah, give it up for the people who make choices for themselves, right? By the way, I'm not suggesting don't listen to your doctor, but I am saying inform yourself and always get a second opinion or third. You know, I wrote this book, Life Force. If you didn't pick it up, I hope you will. I don't care about, I give all the money away from it. It feeds people. But I spent, what, three years interviewing 150 of the top Nobel laureate scientists, regeneration doctors. And one of the things we found was like at John Hopkins, they tell everybody you've got to get a second opinion because 84% of the time when they did their studies, and I put the study in the book so you can look it up, 84% of the time, the second opinion was different than the first. I'm like, oh my God. So you've got to get multiple opinions because humans are humans. No matter how smart we are, doctor, lawyer, person, you got to get their coaching, but you got to decide what's right for you. But my larger point is really simple. You got to say, what does my identity need to be to have the quality of life that I really want? I mean, that's a really interesting question to ask yourself. If you really want to shift your life, if you want to make it something beyond anything you've done before, you might want to say, okay, where am I limited? Where am I not getting what I want? And I, I'll give you an example emotionally. Um, we have so much depression right now since the time of you know, COVID, people being trapped in their homes for so long. And so interestingly enough, you interview people and you see what's going on in their heads and you see that depression for many of them has become an identity. So here's the question. How many of you have ever felt depressed? Raise your hand if you ever felt depressed. If you're in the chat box, give me a thumbs up if you ever felt depressed, right? Almost, if, if you've never felt depressed, you're probably lying to yourself. We've all felt depressed at times. But is there a difference between feeling depressed and being a depressed person? Oh, yes. See, I could feel depressed, but if I became a depressed person, then I'm going to be depressed all the time because I need to stay consistent with my definition of myself. I'll give you an example. Do you think clinically depressed people ever have happy moments? Of course they do. But if you catch them when they go, I'm not really happy, it just looked like I was happy. <laughs> Even if your identity is a negative one, you will feel the, the demand in your nervous system to stay consistent with that definition of yourself. So it is the controlling force for lasting change. And by the way, how many of you made a change in your life that you struggled with for years and then you made the change and it's been a lasting change? And as you think about it now, how many of you can see that you actually shifted your identity in the process? That's why it was a lasting change. Raise your hand if you can see that, perhaps. I'm curious to see. So it's important because it affects everything, everything in your entire life. It also doesn't just affect you, my friends. It affects every relationship you have. Because let's say uh, you have somebody who's you consider a dear friend, okay? And here's this beautiful soul. You think they're a beautiful soul. They got a big heart. They're my dear friend. They give their shirt off their back. And that dear friend of yours, that's your identity for them. They're your dear friend. They're loving. They're sincere. They're special. They're giving. And that dear friend treats you like crap. I mean, as mean as hell to you, you'll be shocked. You'd be hurt. But if this goes on and then you have to go to a meeting or you have to get on a phone call, what will you do in your head about your friend? You'll go... They're probably having a bad what? Day. How many of you have had a day when you wish somebody rationalized your behavior and said, hope you're having a bad day, right? right? Okay. But if there's somebody that you think, let's say you meet somebody, you think they're a manipulator. They're a liar. They're, uh, they don't care about anybody. They just, they just want to make money. They just got wants, you know, they would, they'd take anything from somebody else. They're a manipulator, liar. They're just an evil person. And they don't treat you bad. No, no, no. They treat you real nice. <laughs> What's going to be the first thought in your head, my friends? Put it in the chat. What's the first thought? This mean person starts treating you real nice. What's the first thought? That's right. What do they want? What do they want? 
So by the way, they may not be a bad person. That's just your belief about them. So write this down. All my relationships are controlled by the identity I relate to those people. All of my relationships are controlled by the identity I relate to those people. Because the identity controls how you interact. Does that make sense? And you can have identity not just for one person, but for a group of people. If you believe that men are jerks and assholes and they only want one thing, you're going to look for brown and you're going to find plenty of brown. It's not hard. There's beige men out there. There's pink men out there. There's blue men out there. There's green men out there. But you're going to find the brown. How many know what I'm talking about? And if you think women are manipulators and they, oh, they try to take control of your whole life and they try to take over everything and don't really give a damn about you, they want what they want, then all your relationships with women are going to be terrible. If I meet Susan here, I don't even get a chance to meet Susan because I've already got a definition. But what if your belief is that women are the greatest gift God ever gave because none of us would be on this planet without them, without their courage, without their willing to risk their life to have us come through them for nine months? They are the gift of the earth. Let's give it up for ladies, by the way. Just <laughs> Would that change the way you interact with Susan? Yes or no? Completely. It'll affect all your relationships with women. That's actually what I believe about women, by the way. So the experience of your life is controlled by identity. From your friendships to the people you consider to be not on your side, like some people's stories like nobody loves me or nobody respects me or people get so angry with me or I grew up and I, you know, I feel this way because my parents always talk me down. That's not why you feel this way. Someone can tell your whole life you're worthless, you're a piece of crap and something inside your head says, I'm going to show you. Who knows what I'm talking about? And you don't accept that label for yourself. And by the way, are there people out there that are beautiful inside and out, sexy, beautiful, exterior, beautiful, spiritual, emotional, interior, but don't think they are all the time? And why is it? Their parents told them their whole life, you're beautiful. Other people told them you're sensual, you're beautiful, you're intelligent, you're sexy, you're spiritual. But see, what people say isn't interesting. You only remember the parts that you want to remember to maintain your identity. They said other things too, but you don't remember them. And by the way, the only way you get identity really within yourself, like, you know, the word self-esteem, I hate that word. It's so overused and abused. And people think we're supposed to just talk to our kids a certain way all the time and praise them for everything. Uh, you know, if you think that, you should read uh, Dr. Dweck's work from Stanford. It's been the most extensive work on how parents for the last generation have told their kids they're perfect, they're, they're, you, you deserve everything, you're beautiful, and it is the worst thing you can do to them. Because then they wake up and they believe all that shit you've told them their whole life and they go in the real world and the real world doesn't respond to them like they're perfect and they're this and they're that. And so they retreat back to the world of social media and where they can make shit up and interact the way they want to. That's a pretty big difference. Now you, what you want to praise your kids for is effort. That's what I do with my daughters, with my sons, with all of them. It's like the effort, because if they keep efforting, if they're rewarded for effort, they're going to break through. They're going to eventually get wherever they want. But if you try to make them that, that they're perfect to start with, and they think so, and then they realize they're not, they're going to be scared. So we affect the identity of our children to some extent, but ultimately we all have a choice. So if you want to have an extraordinary quality of life, you're going to have to probably upgrade your identity because you made me have a great identity right now, but how many like to have an even greater one so you perform higher, allow yourself, enjoy more, experience more? So in order to do that, maybe it'll be helpful for you to know how we start to create our identity. And here's how it works. Most people judge who they are by what they do. Jot it down. Most of us develop our identity of who we are by what we do. But the problem with that theory is when people, you know, get in lousy states of mind, frustration, sad, doubt, self-doubt, worry, beating themselves up, people do stupid things. And if you do stupid things, like I said, can smart people do stupid things? Of course. But if you do a bunch of stupid things, after a while you go, I'm not smart, or I'm not worthy, or I'm not whatever. You're judging by your behavior. But <laughs> you're at earth school, baby. <laughs> You're still a human. You're still figuring out who you are, and you're judging too soon. So it's like you got to look at it a little differently. If you're, you know, if 
if uh, the way I started changing my identity is making myself do things that I said I couldn't do or I wouldn't do. Yeah, I met this man, Jim Rohn, this personal development speaker. How many of you ever heard of Jim Rohn, by the way? I'm curious. He's a beautiful man. And at one point, I was telling him all the challenges in my life. And he said, Tony, you need a new philosophy. He said, you know, I can give you strategies. And you'll probably get your own strategies. He was more of a philosopher. He goes, but your philosophy is basically your beliefs. It determines if you're happy or not, what you do and won't do. And he said, I learned a philosophy years ago that I think would be helpful for you. He said, here's the philosophy I learned. It's the philosophy of stretching. Jot it down, the philosophy of stretching. I said, well, what is it? He said, it's this new belief you want to develop in yourself that says, if I say I can't do something, then I must. If I can't, then I must. I said, well, does that mean if I can't jump off a cliff, then I must? He said, don't be stupid, <laughs> right? Don't be stupid. He said, if there's something that you're saying I can't do because I don't have the money, I don't have the time, I don't have the energy, you know, I don't have the background, I don't have the education, but you know if you did it, you'd be a better human, a better father, a better husband, a better friend, a better spirit, a better soul, a better you, then you must get yourself to do it and not hesitate. You know, many of you know one of my seminars we do a fire walk at, and when we do the virtual one, we do wood breaking. We send you the wood, and we teach you what normally people spend a year to do, but we use the wood as a limitation. We put what's limiting you and outside what you're going to become, and, and you break through it, and we do it with kids too. It's really fun. And so, but when you do these experiences, like fire walking, I, I used to do skydiving as my seminar, but you know, once you had 10,000 people, it's hard to get 10 or 20,000 people in the sky in the middle of the night over LA, right? But the point is, I made myself do things that I said I couldn't do, I wouldn't do. It's, I just immediately say, if I can't, then I must. And after doing enough of those, I saw I was a different person than I thought I was. How many follow this? It's so simple. How many get, does this make sense? And the secret is momentum. Like we do a fire walk and we get people prepared and then they'll come up there and all night they've been prepared and they've gone through different emotions, you know. And now they're in front of 2,000 degree burning hot coals and you feel it. And a lot of people went from yes, yes, yes to holy shit, <laughs> you know. I can't do this, I can't do it, I can't do it, right? Their whole nervous system changes. But you can change that fast. And so I have them do something quite physical I teach them to do that changes their state immediately. And then yes, yes, yes. And they go a second later. And after you go, like if you're a salesman, after fire walking, cold calling is not a problem, right? You know, if you're in business, you're in a relationship. Because when your brain goes, if I can get myself to do that, then what else can I get myself to do? So the most powerful way to shift your identity is to put yourself in new states. See how it all comes together? If you put yourself in a peak state of energy and focus, you're going to do things differently that you'll never do at a low energy. And at the high energy state, you'll start developing a new identity. That's why it's so important to develop things you do every day to put yourself in that strong state, mentally, remember, and also physically. And again, I'll, I'm going to give you a little formula for that in a second here. But let me give you an example of how people's identity can be manipulated. And so you understand the power of this. During the Korean War, more Americans collaborated with the enemy than any war in American history. It was insane. And no one could figure out how it happened until afterwards. And what they found out was that the North Koreans worked with the Chinese government at that time. And the Chinese government was against the U.S. And they taught them some simple principles. And the principle was, if you use force, if you use physical abuse to break someone down, you may in fact get them to give you information but they will not change their identity and they'll still scheme, they'll still be against you. But if you use no force whatsoever, but you just wear someone down gently with warmth, and they had a very special technique, here's what'll happen, here's what they do. Instead of bringing you in room and just beating you, because when they ask you questions, you are all trained if you're a soldier, only give your name, rank, and serial number, nothing else. And the Geneva Convention says you don't have to give anything else, but of course, you know, when you're in a concentration camp on enemy lines, they don't care what the, the Geneva Convention says. And so guess what? These guys didn't beat you. So at the end, you could still say, well, I gave the information, but I had to, or I was going to die. They didn't do that. They put you in a room for 18 hours of talk. And they'd just talk with you. And they'd be warm to you. They wouldn't give you a big gift, because then you could say, oh, they, they gave me this food that I desperately need. They gave you nothing. They might give you a cigarette. But they'd talk to you, and they'd say, we just want to understand. Like, 
we're not invading your country. Why are you here bombing ours? And how can you, as a person, I'm sure you're a caring person, come and shoot people in their own homeland that you don't even know? You don't even understand who we are. And the person's like, but this goes on and on. And then they ask him questions and say, can't you see that in your country there are people that are unemployed, that have no money? But here in a communist country, everyone has a job. They leave out that they get 50 cents a day, but they have a job, right? <laughs> right? And I said, you know, it's true. I mean, can't you? And after 17, 18, 19, 20 hours of exhaustion, the brain's gone. And they'd say, can't you just admit the truth? And finally, the person's fine. Okay, we, we do have unemployed people, and you don't. Okay, I can see that. And they say, well, okay, write that down. And they get them to write it down because they're so exhausted. And can't you see? And they build this story till by the end, they had a couple paragraphs that basically thrashed America indirectly and was pro-communism. And they said, well, thank you for your honesty and your truth. And then no abuse, nothing else, and no reward. They'd send you finally back the reward. You got to go sleep. But then what they would do is they get on the speaker system with all the prisoners could hear, and they would read your essay. And the worst part is people like come to you and go, did you say that? Did you do that? Well, uh, did they beat you? Did they? Well, no, but did they give you? F- no, but uh, well, why'd you do it? Because it's true. And in that moment, their identity changed. In that moment, they would work with the enemy from then on. Because they'd go, it's true. There, there's no unemployment here. There's this, there's that. So they got them to do something outside their character enough, and they got the world to reinforce them to be that way, and they shifted. So I want you to get, there's no, how many get, there's no more powerful force on earth than your identity. If you want lasting change, this is what we got to change. How many get, make some noise if I, if I know you got out there. Come on, let me hear you out there. Make some noise, make some energy. Come on. may say, okay, Tony, how would I shift my identity? Well, I'll tell you how I created this Tony Robbins guy. He's me, but I, I augmented these parts of myself. You know, I wasn't outgoing. I wasn't driven. I always loved people. That's been my nature for as long as I can remember. I was like, you know, I'd go to the grocery store because my mom was kind of trapped in the house because of her use of drugs and so forth. So when I was like seven, eight years old, I go on my bike to the grocery store every day to get the groceries. And I became friends with all the people there. On Easter, I'd make cookies and shit and give them to people and write Christmas cards. And I was just that kind of person. But I wasn't driven. I wasn't focused. I certainly wasn't someone who was going to shake the building with my energy. But I started reading. I started feeding my mind. And I started reading autobiographies. And the great thing about an autobiography, it's written by the author, and they're great men and women, is as you read the words that are written on the page, those are their thoughts. You actually begin to think like them. And then I, you know, I, I started picking up books. I read this book called The Magic of Believing by Claude M. Bristol, and it talked about how to program your mind. And I was only 17 years old, and I was on my own. I'm sleeping in this you know, a little uh, laundry room of a neighbor because my mom kicked my dad out. He went back east. Now I'm on my own. I had to figure out what the hell to do. And so I started programming my mind because I was so depressed. And the way I did it was I wrote all these incantations. Now, not affirmations. You know, you can go, I'm happy, I'm happy, I'm happy, I'm happy. And your brain goes, read between the lines, I'm not happy. <laughs> you know, right? that's just not it, right? So uh, that doesn't do it. What It's an incantation is when you say it with such intensity, with such volume, with such emotion, that it generates this shift inside you. That, and if you do it with enough repetition, in fact, write this down. Anything you attach the words I am to, anything you attach the words I am to, that you do consistently enough, intensely enough, emotionally enough, you will become. Anything you attach the words I am to, that you speak consistently enough, intensely enough, emotionally enough, you will become. And so I pretty much like hypnotized myself into being this guy. And I'll tell you the day that changed my life the most dramatically. 
I was on my own. The way I supported myself is I worked as a janitor. I'm mean, still in high school. And um, so I literally, I didn't have a car. My mom kept my cars before I got the next one. And I would take these buses to go to this place called San Marino, California. Some friends out there from California. I know you know where that is. And it was, you know, it was only about f- uh, 15 miles from where I lived. But it was, you know, two different buses and shifts, you know, buses stopping constantly. So, you know, it was about an hour and a half bus ride. And I would go there and I cleaned two banks. And I loved it because it wasn't hourly pay. I got paid for the results. So if I could do a great job in less time, wonderful. And I did it in the middle of the night. And I'd finish usually about 1.30, quarter to 2 in the morning. And then I'd catch the 2 o'clock bus. And I'd come on home. And then I'd sleep three and a half hours and get up and go to school. It was pretty brutal. And the night that changed my life was an identity-changing life. I was being a victim still. My mom kicked me out of the house and... Oh my God, and I miss my family, and my dad's no longer here, and all this crap, and feeling sorry for myself. And that night, I finished the banks and everything else, and you know, did my normal thing. I left notes for people and stuff. You know, I just want to make people happy. And um, and I came out. I sat at the bus stop, and it's two o'clock, no bus. I got there, you know, ten to two. Two o'clock, no bus. Two o five, no bus. Two fifteen, two thirty, no bus. I'm standing there at this point, going, How am I gonna get home? And then all of a sudden, a car drives by. It's 2.30, 2.40 in the morning. And the guy rolls the window and goes, hey, man, didn't you see the news? And there's a bus strike. <laughs> a bus strike. And he drives off. It's the middle of the night. You know, I'm 15, maybe 16 miles from home. I don't know. There's nobody I can call. And I got to get home. And I get up and go to school. And so something inside of me snapped. And I just read this book about programming your mind and using incantations. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to run home. Now, I didn't run. I jogged (laughs) because I'd never run even four miles or three and a half miles. And I was a little bit overweight, you know? And I just decided I'm going to do this. But as I ran, I kept saying as loud as I could. And I'm on the street. You know, it's the middle of the night, so no one's there. And I'm going, every day and every way, I'm getting stronger and stronger. Every day. I actually started out with, I'm going to show her. I'm going to show her. My mom, I was pissed, right? (laughs) So I I used anger at first. And then anger wears out. You know, you don't want to be an angry person. And I was like, no, what, what up? I'm going to use this for greater good. Every day and every way, I'm getting stronger and stronger. Every day and every way, I'm getting stronger and stronger. And every day and every way, I'm becoming more and more happy. Every day. And then I'd say it like, happy. And I was literally yelling this at the top of my lungs as I'm doing this run. And I ran 14 miles. I didn't run 15. I stopped at a place called Azusa to stop and walk the last mile, or mile and a half, two miles to Glendora. Um, But it was something I never would have dreamed I could have done. And... It completely changed my identity. In fact, to this day, when something really intense happens, I know I know how to pull on that part of Tony Robbins. It's when I really started to find him. But I did it for hours. And then after that, I started creating more incantations because, you know, I had no money. It's like no one in my family had any money. It's like, okay, I'm going to create this incantation, you know. God's wealth is circulating in my life. His wealth is flowing to me in avalanches of abundance. All my needs, desires, and goals are met instantaneously by infinite intelligence. For I'm one with God and God is everything. And I would say it and I would shout it, avalanches of abundance for an hour as I went on a walk or a jog. And then I do it in my old Volkswagen once I got another Volkswagen. I'm driving along and I go into a meeting and I'm shouting as long as I possibly could. Then I was going to do my first little speeches And I do this piece that I still do backstage to this day. I I now direct my subconscious mind. I I go, I command my subconscious mind to direct me and helping as many people as possible today by giving me the strength, the emotion, the persuasion, the humor, the brevity, whatever it takes to show these people and get these people to change their life now. I would do that for hours. Now I do it one or two times and then I walk out and I'm ready. I don't have to do it, but it's in my nervous system, but I do it. So I literally created this man that's before you now. He was me, but I brought those parts by calling on them. Think about this. How do you make your dog your dog? How do you get a dog and make him your dog? Put it, put it in the notes. I want to see. How would you make your dog your dog? I'm curious. How do you do it? There you go. You name him and you train him or her to come when you call. Well, I named those parts of me and I train them to come when I call. That's the identity that you want. And that's how you do it. You're not going to get it by just thinking it. You're going to do it by doing things 
that are consistent with your new identity. It's acting as if, if I was that person, what would I do? Then I'm going to do that. If I can't, then I must. And I'm going to push myself. And the rewards are immense. How many are up for this? How many are up for an update for your identity out there? All right, you've been sitting too long. Stand up for a minute now. Shake your body out. Shake your body out. Stand up. Shake it out. Make the sound you've been making you feel felt unstoppable, unshakable. Make that sound, ladies and gentlemen, nice and loud. Use your body. I'm burning up. Can nobody see? some virtual high fives out there, ladies and gentlemen, or somebody nearby, grab a seat. Holy cow, I'm sweating. <laughs> Sorry for the sweat. <laughs> oh, the air went out in here. I'm down in the basement and I'm wearing this sweater. Holy cow, but I'm here to deliver. So if you don't mind my sweat, we'll continue. <laughs> right. So now let me show you when someone is having challenges, oh, oh, sounds like maybe some air is coming in. Um, when we're having challenges in our lives, we're all going to have challenges. But I look at this, what I call five to thrive. There's five things that I look at. If someone's not making progress, this is where I look immediately to help them to change. And so this is like a shortcut of all these things. Because in my life, what I've tried to do is compress decades into days. It's like, I have a core belief. You might want to write it down. And the belief is that, Complexity is the enemy of execution. Complexity is the enemy of execution. If you make something too complex, people aren't going to do it. If you're trying to build a business and you've got a plan that's too complex, it doesn't get implemented. So it takes more time to make things simple. But over the years, I've tried to make it simpler and simpler and simpler. So I'd like you in your notes to just, if you would, draw a little triangle. And then in the middle, write the word state. Because what controls your life is your state. If you're a state of gratitude, you're going to behave totally differently than if a state of anger or frustration or loneliness. If you're in a place of excitement, you're going to do things very differently as well. So our state is controlled by three things and then eventually two more. But we're going to start with the core three. You've learned some of these a little bit, just even in the you know, little bit of time we've had together. If I want to change how I feel and I'm feeling depressed, the fastest way to change my state if I was feeling depressed or angry or sad, any state I don't want to feel... I don't want to deny it, but I don't want to sit there and just hang out with it, right? You need to change it. And by the way, when should you change a lousy state? As quickly as you start feeling it. I'll tell you why. You don't want to wait till the monster is Godzilla taking your town. You want to kill the monster when it's a baby monster. How many understand what I'm saying here? Say I. Say I. So the first thing to change your state is the radical change in what we call your physiology, your physiology. It's just, a, it's just a big word for anything that changes your physical body. Most people, when they don't like the way they feel, go, what do they do? When most people like the way they feel, they want to change how they feel. They're feeling frustrated. They're feeling angry. They're feeling overwhelmed. They're feeling stressed. What do most people do? They have a drink, right? A soda pop, or they have a drink of alcohol, or they have a toke of something. Or they take prescription medication these days that they can get and self-prescribe themselves. Or they go shopping. That's a different thing. That's changing their focus, right? Or they go watch a movie. That's changing their focus. But anything you do that changes your body will change your state, obviously. That's why alcohol does well. That's why drugs do too. But they have side effects. 
But you can create a change in physiology just by a radical change in your movement, in your voice. Remember when I showed you yesterday what Harvard showed? Just standing a certain way will change your biochemistry. Increase your testosterone. Reduce your cortisol, which is the stress hormone. Get you to go for it. Just two minutes of standing that way. Well, more, more dynamic movement and the use of your voice will do it even faster. So I want you to just think of it this way. Right now in your chair, just do me a favor for a second. Right now in your chair, create a sense of total excitement like a little kid. Do whatever you do with your body. If you're totally excited in your chair, listen. That's it. That's it. Come on now. Come on. Now double the excitement. What are we going to do? Double it. How many feel better right now? Make some noise if you feel better. All right? Now, notice what you did with your body. Did you rise up or down? Did you express more volume or less volume? Did you move slower or faster? Most of you, put in the notes. Which one did you do? Did you rise up or down more when you're doing it, even if you're in your chair? Did you talk fast, or did you make sounds louder or quieter, right? Did you clap? Were you more passive or more active? What did you, you do with your face? Some people say, I'm happy. Well, when are you going to tell your face about it, <laughs> right? You know, it might be a good thing to start with, right? Because you know what? You have 37 different muscles in your face. For most people, this is the largest area of unemployment in the country, Right? <laughs> because they keep using the same expression so they keep feeling the same feelings every day. You know, try something right now. Look at somebody on the screen, even if you're another country, or whatever, let's put other people on the screen and do what I call facial aerobics. As many different facial expressions as you can for 30 seconds. Go ahead, do it real quick, just do it. Facial, ex- try it. different facial expressions. Come on, get a little crazy. That's it, come on, facial aerobics. There you go. Oh, yes. All right, so that's just moving it around a little bit. Now, by the way, notice the pattern, what you did when you were in an excited place. Now do this. Put yourself in a state where you're bored and you're tired. How do you sit when you're bored and tired? And maybe add pissed off to that. Bored, tired, just a little pissed off. And notice, where'd your body go? By the way, notice, I didn't have to tell you where to go to be bored and tired. You knew exactly where to go. (laughs) But what'd you do? Did your body come up or down? Just notice. Is the breath more shallow or more full? Is there more movement than excitement or a lot less movement than excitement? Are you bending forward at all, which, by the way, compresses your diaphragm and usually gives you less oxygen versus if you're up, right? Right? What's happened to your face? Is it going up or down? Are you touching your face like this? Right? Now go from that, watch this, go from that to total excitement just for fun. Total excitement, break it, come on, come on. So now, notice the difference in the pattern in your body. It's radically different, obviously. Think about this. People, let's put the camera up a little bit. People come up to me on the street all the time, and it's so funny, because they'll say, hey, you're Tony Robbins. Oh, my God, can I ask you a question or whatever? And then they'll come up to me, and they'll say something like this. They'll go, I don't know what it is, but I just, I just feel down all the time. Why do you feel like I'm so down all the time? Right? Like, well, look at your body, right? I'm so up. Why do you think I'm so up? Why do you think I'm having such a great time? See, the way you move your face, your breath, your body, your gestures, and of course your hydration, all radically affects your biochemistry, all radically affects your emotion. It changes, controls your whole life. 
So write down physiology first. If you want to change how you feel, make a radical change in your physiology. Not a little change. You know, like sometimes we do the fire walk or with the wood breaking and somebody's like, all right, I'm ready to do this. And then like, oh, I'm not sure. I'm really not sure. Uh, Mr. Robbins said if I'm scared, I should make this strong move. And watch this. This is what they'll do. They'll go, uh, oh, shit, it didn't work. It didn't work. <laughs> No, it's like, yes, yes, yes. And your brain goes, holy shit, he means it. We're walking, let's go, right? right? It changes you completely when you do a radical change versus a trying change, right? If you make a little change, you're gonna get, with your body, you're gonna get a little change in everything else. Now, did I just lose everybody? Because I lost the entire screen of everybody there. Am I still connected? Uh-oh. Can you guys still see me? Okay, I can't see anybody, so you can bring them back up. That'd be great. I'll just continue. So what I want you to understand is physiology first. If you change your physiology, that's why if you have like a daily workout plan or just even 10 minutes you do something physical each day, just to get yourself going, you're going to feel different about your day, right? If you change the second part of the triad, that's changing what we call your focus. Your focus. Somebody need to do something here? You can go ahead. Go ahead and walk by me. It's okay. There goes the technical man. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> okay, good. As long as you can see me, that's okay. I can at least read what you're seeing there. So thank you. So I know you're still with me. So the bottom line is the second part of that triangle on the left there is focus. Real quick. And we've already talked about this. If you change what you focus on, you change how you feel that fast. So if I said to you right now, I want you to think of something in your life that you're really, truly grateful for. I mentioned this earlier, but this time I want you to think of something. How many of you can think of something? Give me a thumbs up so I can, since I can't see anyone yet. How many can think of something that you're, or someone you're incredibly grateful for? Give me a thumbs up if you would. There we go. Awesome. So I want you to close your eyes and think about that person or that situation you're grateful for. And just as you're focusing on it, really be there. Like step in your body like you're there. Like you're, don't focus from a distance. Like, you know, you can remember being on a roller coaster, you know, from a distance, or you can remember what it was like in the front seat when you're stepping over the edge. I want you to remember what you're grateful for like you're there. And breathe and feel that feeling. And then see if you can't increase it just a little bit. Like make that gratitude 20% more. What would you do with your face, or your body, or your breath, or your focus to make it feel even more grateful? Yeah, that's beautiful. Oh, I can see a few of you again. That's nice. Gorgeous. Raise your hand if you can feel that gratitude in your body right now. If you're really feeling it, raise your hand or give me a thumbs up in the chat. Beautiful. Beautiful. Let's try a different one now. I want you to think of a moment in your life, something, um, let's take an example of, oh, I know, I think of a romantic moment. I want you to think of a sexy moment, a sensual moment, or a romantic moment in your life. And just close your eyes and focus on that moment, but again, like you're there, not like you're remembering from a distance. Step in your body and breathe the way you were breathing then. See what you're seeing in that really romantic or sensual or sexy moment. Just feel it like you're there. As you focus on that moment. Notice and feel how you breathe differently, don't you? you? Feel your face, your body. And what were you focusing on in that moment, that sensual moment? And were you making sounds? Were you getting religious? Oh God, oh God, or demanding, give me more. What were you doing in that moment? <laughs> okay, raise your hand if you can feel that. Romantic or sexy moment. Raise your hand if you can feel it. I want you to pick one more. Pick, pick, if you ever, have, you ever have something happen that was so silly or so stupid, maybe you did something. I know when I've done something so silly or stupid, sometimes I crack myself up because it's just so dumb. Or someone else did something so silly or stupid where you laughed so hard you couldn't stop laughing. Who's ever had one of those things? You're laughing so hard, like like if you're drinking something, it, come out, it came out your nose while you're laughing, you know? Or, or you, you cough. Close your eyes and remember a time when you laughed out of control. Something so silly or stupid made you laugh out loud. And breathe the way you breathe when you laugh out loud. That's it, and feel it, that's it, feel it. 
Think of another moment that made you just laugh out loud that you just couldn't, you couldn't stop laughing, laugh so hard. That's it. And breathe it and feel it. And notice how good it feels. How do you breathe when you laugh out loud? That's right, beautiful. And raise your hand if you can feel this inner laughter right now, if you feel it inside you, ladies and gentlemen. Let's do one more. I want you to think of something that if you wanted to be excited, you could be excited. Something in your life right now that if you wanted to be excited about it and you focused on it, you could be excited. So focus on something that could excite you if you wanted to be excited. That's it. And notice how you breathe when you start focusing on something that's exciting. And what's the look on your face when you start to get excited? Yeah. And then let that energy grow. You double the amount of excitement. What would you have to do to double it with your focus? What if you add your physiology? Do something with your body as well and get more excited. That's it. Add your body and your focus together. That's it. That's it. That's it. It's gone again, guys. It's gone again, guys. Hey, guys. My team, it's gone again. It's gone again. Now triple the excitement. Whatever you got to do, triple it. Great, make a fist and say yes. Say yes. Say yes. Now, all we did was change your focus. And by the way, notice when we added physiology and focus, right? It increased it. If you use more of your face, if you use more actual laughter, if you start to move your body. So if you want to change how you feel, which is why we do everything, by the way. Like why people say, what do you want? I want a billion dollars. What, you want a billion pieces of paper with pictures of dead people on it? Is that what you want? <laughs> no, well, what do you want money for? Well, I want money for freedom. I want money for security. I want money so I can give things away. Well, those are feelings, aren't they? The feelings of freedom, the feelings of security. People can have a lot of money and still not be free and still not be secure. True? So think about that. Everything you do, you do to change how you feel subconsciously or consciously. Either you're feeling good and you want to feel even better, or you're not feeling good and you want to change. That's what's behind all your subconscious decisions. So I want to just show you how fast you can change. Change your body, change your focus, and the third, change your language. Because words, write down, create meaning. Words create meaning. So certain words will change how you feel. If you said to me, Tony, Listen, if I said to you, hey, bye, guys, during the next break, we have some delicious snacks here. It's very different than if I say we have some nutritious snacks here. <laughs> Notice one gets clapping, one gets a little bit of laughter, right? If you said, Tony, I know uh, you meet so many millions of people. I'm single. I can't find the right person. You know I'm a good person. Couldn't you introduce me to somebody? Couldn't you hook me up? And I say to you, well, I know this one man. I know this one woman. They're real nice, <laughs> right? Versus they're delicious, right? <laughs> or sexy or sensual or playful or anything else. How many follow what I'm talking about here? Say I. <laughs> so the words that we use actually create emotion as well. When you attach a word to your experience, it becomes your experience. It changes your biochemistry. So for example, I remember my mom she used to always feel humiliated about everything. And one day I figured it out. She's humiliated about everything because anything uncomfortable she calls humiliated. So imagine like life is sending you this experience, but you have this cookie cutter of words. And the word she used for every negative emotion is I'm humiliated, so it would increase it. Versus someone else might say, well, this is a little uncomfortable. Someone says to me, somebody stabbed me in the back. And I'll say, turn around. I don't see the, I don't see the scar. They go, you know what I mean? No, tell me what you mean. They go, well, they, they betrayed me. And I go, okay, well, tell me what they did. And eventually we get to, they told somebody something, they told them not to tell someone. But that's very different than stabbed in the back. When you use stabbed in the back as language, your body contracts. How many understand what I'm saying here? If it makes sense, say I. <laughs> so these three, and by the way, language is not just words. There are certain phrases you say. Remember yesterday I gave you that example of, you know, I don't know what the salt is, I don't know what the salt is, I don't know what the salt is, and all of a sudden you can't find the salt, right? Because you keep telling yourself something, create a stacoma. 
So these three forces control your state. And you can use them at any moment, in any time, and they will work no matter what's going on in your life. They're a fact, they're science. However, whether you're going to use them or not, put a circle now around your triangle, and there's two factors that are going to determine whether you use it or not. And the first factor at the top I want you to write down is a compelling future. Across the top, a compelling future. Remember, I mentioned this yesterday. If you're telling yourself a story that nothing ever works, nothing ever will, I shouldn't be here, my family died, I should have died, you know, I'm, I'm not enough, I can't provide for my kids. We as human beings go through these stages of negativity. It's part of being human. And especially we've had a bunch of negative experiences in a, in a row, and almost everybody has. What would be crazy is if you really saw the people I work with who were the most successful on earth, and you got to see all the shit that they go through to be there. Because they look like, they make it look easy. But you know what? LeBron shoots a thousand shots a day in practice to make it look so easy. Right? You look, <laughs> you look at somebody like Gold State Warriors and you see a guy chomp on his mouthpiece like he's Bugs Bunny and he makes shots from half court. Why? He practices thousands of times every single day for his entire life so that when he does that, it works. But you don't see that. Write this down. People get rewarded in public for what they practice in private consistently. We all get rewarded in public for what we practice in private consistently. And if you don't practice in private, you're, you're not going to get there. So the language, the focus, the physiology is there, but we won't use it if we don't have a compelling future. If we don't have a story that says, even if today is tough, this is what I'm going to create. This is who I really am. This is where I'm really going. How many get how important it is to create a compelling future? <laughs> Write this down. Jim Rohn taught me this phrase. He said, Tony, your goals affect you whatever they are. What does that mean, your goals affect? Well, if your goal is to make it through the day, you're going to have a shitty day. If your goal is to light up every person you meet in some simple way, a smile, a touch, you're going to have the most incredible day. If your goal is, you know, to take care of yourself, you get a certain level of insight because you're part of life. Life supports life. You're gonna, but when all of a sudden, instantly overnight, I had three children as I adopted them because I married this woman, and then I had a child on the way, holy cow. Now I got a different level of insight. I'm not just taking care of me. I'm taking care of this family. When it's, oh, I want to take care of my community, you get better insights. If you want to help humanity, I don't mean virtue signaling bullshit. I'm not what you write in, on your social media. I mean, you want to know who I am. You don't have to read your social media. You can see how my feet and my lips and my heart and my wallet and my movement has been for 45, 46 years. You know who the hell I am. That's, you can't fake that because it's, it's by actions. So not only do I know my identity of myself, but if you've done any homework on me, you know who the hell I am. Your own experience of me. So the compelling future, you've got to create something you're going for. And then the bottom is the most important base and the bottom of the circle, and that is you have to constantly reinforce an identity that reminds you that you're more than anything you're facing. You've got to remember who I am is more than anything I'm facing, that what I've done is not who I am. I'm just, I am an earth school, I am growing, I'm expanding, I'm about to have another burst of explosion of growth. Now, this stuff happens by immersing yourself. It doesn't happen when you live your life because when people live their life, they get caught up in all the urgencies of life. They do stuff that's urgent but not important. One of the reasons I do seminars four days long, or even here, just a couple hours a day with you, but the ideal is 12, 13 hours is because your brain rewires over that time. When you do 12, 13 hours for four days in a row, you are completely rewired. We don't have to get you to try to remember this stuff. It's in your body. You're doing it. So you need to get your identity expanded in your body. And I told you the ways that I've done it. In the seminar, we do it constantly. But I did it every run, every walk, every everything. Who I am, strengthening it, feeling it, shouting it out loud, embodying it until I became it. That's the base. So these five things, if you're not where you want to be, how you're feeling or what you're doing, start with your physiology. Go to your focus. But you're not going to do those unless you first have got something you're going for and ideally something more than yourself. It's got to be for your family. It's got to be for something more than just you and you. If you're going to be successful in business and you only get in business to make money, those people never make money. I'll tell you, I shouldn't say never. Rarely. The reason is because in building a business in the beginning, it's hard. It's like having a child. 
there's not a lot of rewards. There's only this is my kid. <laughs> That's the reward, right? It's a lot of work. But we don't think about the work. We focus on, wow, this is our baby girl, our baby boy, whatever. Same thing with your business. Oh, I love this. It's an expression of who you're, what you're giving to the world. But if it's just money, yeah, usually you're going to burn out and try something else, try something else, and, and be a dabbler and never master anything. So these are called the five to thrive. I want you to keep this in front of you and say, what could I improve on? Could you make a better pattern in your physiology? Could there be some new movements you do throughout the day that use a trigger, like once an hour, once every couple hours, set yourself an alarm, get up, move my body, crank it, turn some music on. What am I focusing on, right? What language do I need to get rid of? Like I stopped using the word I'm depressed because I'm depressed as an identity. And so that's what I did back when I was 17, 18. And I said, I actually made a poster that says, only a loser is depressed, which is, by the way, not true. Lots of winners get depressed. We all can feel depressed. But in my brain, the one thing I wasn't was a loser. So when I did that, it's like, I knew that when I was depressed, I was so depressed, I was thinking, do I belong here in this world? Do I need to stick around? So I took it out of my vocabulary, and I can tell you honestly, I've been through so many ups and downs in my life in the last, you know, 46 years. But I can tell you, I've never been depressed. I've been pissed off. I've been frustrated. I felt sad at times. Some melancholy, but never depressed because I took it on my vocabulary and it's not there. So remember, your words create meaning and meaning creates biochemistry. How many find this could be really useful for you going forward here, ladies and gentlemen? All right. Now, would you stand up one more time? I have one last piece for you that I think you're going to find really useful. It's really important. Here we go. Wake your body up again. Let's do it. Oh, thank God it's getting cool in here. Get some strong, playful physiology. Move like you're a little crazy. Wake it up. And make a sound while you're doing it. It feels playful, exciting, playful sound. fist bumps. If someone's beside you, do it in person. Awesome. Grab a seat. When you sit down, take a little sip of water if you can. Stay hydrated. If you start feeling tired, it's because you're dehydrated usually. That's right. I got all dehydrated. I could use some water. Someone not looking out for me here would be helpful. Thank you. All right. Now in your chair, create more energy than when you were standing. Let's go. Your dog's having a good time there, Ronald. All right. Whoa. Yes. All right. I hope you got some water. I got a little bit of air. I'm starting to dry out here. <laughs> this is great. All right. So the last subject here that ties into identity is I want to talk to you about this concept of identity and how it affects your decisions in other areas, but also how it affects your career or your business. And if we talk about identity in those words, we'd use the word brand, wouldn't we? Right? We all need to develop a brand. If you develop a brand, you're more valuable than anything else. I'll give you an example. Um, I've been doing what I'm doing here for 45, this is my 46th year, and I've done it in you know, 195 countries around the world. 
and I can go places now. I went places for the first time. I go to like, I went to the Sahara Desert and I got this giant group for me. I went to Dubai and we had 10,000 people. I'd never been there before. How do they all show up? Because I built an identity of serving and they got through something. How many of you, before you came to this event, had already had some positive impression of me in some way through a, a video or a book or an audio or a friend told you about it? Raise your hand if you already had a positive frame of reference. Well, that makes it a lot easier for someone to build their business, right? Because you built the brand. People will get on the ground and reach behind a no-name brand to get a Coca-Cola, won't they? Right? The power of a brand is to give certainty. And so while you branded yourself with your identity, some of you, your old story, if you look at the story, the real core of the story is the limiting identity you had of yourself. And the thing that made me most happy in reading some of your new stories is I saw as you change the story, there was a change in who you are and the way you define yourself as more than enough, as a person who breaks through, as a person that finds the way. The more you can brand yourself in your own mind, the more powerful it's going to be. But I want to show it to you by showing it also how to affect your business. By the way, how many of you, show me in the chat box with a thumbs up if that's you, or live, raise your hand. How many of you own your own business? I'm curious. How many own your own business? Work for yourself. Raise your hand. Make some noise so I can see who's out there percentage-wise. Wow. Quite a few of you, a large percentage. Looks like usually in my seminars, it's about 60, 70%. You know, this one's about 40, 50, 60%, somewhere in that same range. So think of it this way. If I, I'm going to give you an assignment. Take out a pen and paper if you got it or your iPad or whatever you got there. Hopefully you've been taking notes. By the way, I hope you take notes because if you just listen to me, you're going to hold on to about 10% of what I say, say, a month from now. But if you listen and take notes, as I shared with you, it, the physical act of writing it down, even if you don't read it again, drives the grooves deeper in your brain. You're more likely to retain 40 to 50%. But if you listen, take notes, and then you yell back the answers, you use your body, you do the physical exercise, you do the challenge, you'll find you'll retain between 90 and 95% of the core things that really matter. So I, and I don't want you wasting your time, so I really encourage you to do that. But in your notes right now, let's just write down just the first answer to this question. If I said to you, think of, think of a soft drink company. The first soft drink company you think of, jot it down. And then I want you to think of, let's see, a, a big computer company. The first big computer company you think of, jot it down. Big computer company. And then I want you to think, if you would, of, um, think of a search engine, the first search engine you think of and write it down. Okay? So what's a soft drink you think of? First one you think of? What's a big computer company you think of? What search engine you think of? All right, let's 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 start out with a soft drink. All right, we're going to throw it up on the screen. How many of you thought of Coca-Cola? Raise your hand if you thought of Coca-Cola so I can see you make some noise. You thought of Coca-Cola. Put your thumbs up in the chat if you thought of Coca-Cola. Keep your hands up in the chat. Do it as well. I'm trying to get a good bench. It's about 90% of you, right? How many of you thought of Pepsi? Raise your hand. Pepsi. Okay, and so you see it's, you know, maybe 10% Pepsi. One owns 90% of the market. In fact, they have a goal of how many, all the liquids you drink, including water that they want to own, right? This company's been around a very long time. How powerful is it when somebody says, hey, can I have a Coke? The people at Pepsi hate that. They may not want a Coke. <laughs> they want a cola, right? But they're used to calling it Coke, and the people say, hate that. They own the category. All right. How many of you, when I said computer company, thought of Apple computers, thought of Apple? Raise your hand if you thought of Apple. Make some noise if you thought of Apple. Put it on the screen, guys. Wake up. Wow. That's like 90% plus. Okay. How many thought of Dell? Dell computers. I'm curious. Dell. Hewitt Packard. Okay. Somewhere like three, four, five percent, right? So Apple owns the category. That doesn't mean you don't use that, but they are the first person people think of, all right? How about search engine? How many of you thought of Google? Raise your hand. Wow. Okay. How many thought of Yahoo? <laughs> okay. Like two people, <laughs> right? So, by the way, Yahoo used to be the fo source for searching, not Google. They were the dominant force, weren't they? To the Google boys came together and came up with a way to make more money at it. 
by having us compete to buy the ads. They made so much money, they dominated the market. They created a whole different approach. How many of you use Bing? Bing, raise your hand if you use Bing. One man from Microsoft, one man, that's it. Okay, very good, Bing, right? So notice the domination that comes when you become the brand people think of first. You know, there are a lot of people that when they want to send something overnight, they go FedEx it. The people at UPS hate that shit. (laughs) It's like, no, you mean overnight it. Don't say FedEx it, but a lot of people say say FedEx it. They're not saying they're just saying send it overnight. They were first in the mind and the heart. They locked it in. Some of you say, would you pass the Kleenex? The people at Scott Tissue hate that. (laughs) It's not Kleenex, it's tissue, right? So I want you to think about what's the power that you would have in your business or your career, because some of you don't own a business, but we all have careers. If when people think of something that they need or want, they thought of you first. That's pretty amazing, right? That gives you a competitive advantage that is mind-blowing in business and life and anything else you want to do. And you might say, well, Tony, I don't have the money to become Coke or do something like that. You don't have to. All you got to do is find a way to find out who your marketplace is. If you work for someone else, it's your boss and your boss's boss. You build an identity or they don't even know who you are. When they're making decisions, as they've just done in the tech sector, they let go of 190,000 jobs in the last month. 190,000, 10,000 from Microsoft, you know, 6,000 from Salesforce. You know, was it uh, 7,500 or more now, I guess, from Twitter, right? Boom, 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 boom. When they're thinking about letting somebody go, your identity matters. If they're thinking about, hey, we need somebody for this upgraded position, your identity matters. Your income is more tied to your brand than almost anything else, whether you know it or not. So you want to build a brand. Number one, the brand within yourself, like we've talked about today, that makes you go for it, makes you be the person that's going to step up instead of step back, right? If your old habit is, I can't do it out of the money, out of the time, I just, you might not have the money and the time. I didn't either. I wouldn't borrow the freaking money, and I got the, thing, the skills that I needed because I was like, if I don't go to this seminar with Jim Rohn back in those days, then, like, you know, then I'm never going to change. I'm never going to pay my rent. So I took the money to pay my rent, and I went, and I learned. And then what I learned changed my life. Otherwise, you'd be doing the same thing over and over again. So you've got to build the brand in yourself that says, I'm going to go for it, or I'm going to take on the challenge, or I'm willing to take intelligent risks, right? So that's the number one. But in business, you need as well. So I want to give you five quick steps, because we're almost out of time here. I said I'd go about two hours and get real close real fast here. I want to give you five quick steps to building a unique identity or building a unique brand. We'll just go through it real fast, and then I got a fun assignment for you, and we'll wrap it up here. And we also have a a little celebration. We have a few things to give some people who really delivered for the community here, some fun stuff here as well. So number one, number one, you're never going to build a brand unless you understand the power of a brand, the true power of a brand or true power of identity. And I hope, how many, I don't, how, I don't have to go any further. How many of you have got today, identity controls everything, controls the way I think, the way I feel, what I do. How many got it? Make some noise if you got it. Awesome. Then step two, once you know the power, now you know I got to invest time in this because it's the most powerful thing. It controls how I act, how I think, how I feel. It controls my relationships. By the way, when you first get in a relationship, you have an identity for your partner. Then if you get in a relationship and now you have different worlds and you have to go to different states and you have to deal with different frustrating things and you might get frustrated with your partner, you know, when people's relationships break down, it's because they change the identity for their partner. They start putting stickies over them, but they don't see their partner anymore. They see the labels on their partner. Well, oh, they're selfish. They, they don't care about me. They just care about themselves. They're prior. They want me to do everything. They don't care. And once you do that enough times and you make the identity for your partner, your relationship is going to end. Even if you stay together physically, your relationship's going to end. You have to be so careful about the labels you attach to yourself or to your partner in a relationship because it shapes everything, okay? So then number two, once you know how important this is, put it up on the screen, number two for you here is you need to identify and articulate what is your identity, what is your competitive advantage, what is special about you? And I don't mean I'm so special and, you know, you know, Jim, what was that guy on, uh, on Saturday Night Live? I'm special, I'm unique, and people really like me. You know, I'm not talking about that stuff. I'm talking about, let's say, in business. If I was in business, you'd say, why should I do business with you versus someone else? 
And if you can't tell me that, if you can't articulate that well, it's going to be hard for you to build an identity or a brand. So in the beginning, it's kind of clunky. But I'm going to ask you, we're going to take a minute, just literally a minute in a second here, and I'm going to ask you to write out what is, well, in fact, let's make it even easier. Let's do it really fast. Try something with me. Type right now in the chat. Type, if you would, who are you? Just the first things that come through you. Just a little thing. Who are you? I'm a lover. I'm a creator. I'm a what? Who are you? Put it in there. Put it in there, and I want to see it come across here. Let me see. Okay? I'm a playful person. I'm a lover. I'm a challenge. I'm, I'm an achiever. I overcome. Yes, come on. Give me more of them. I'm an inventor. I'm faith. I'm a kind person. I'm a queen. I'm an action-driven person. I'm filled with love, faith, and compassion. I'm a mom. My love can't be broken. I'm excitement. I am. By the way, it's different to say I feel excited than I am excitement, isn't it? That's an identity. I'm a master of life. I'm an inspiration. I'm a masculine kind soul. I am woman. I am a leader. I'm a badass inventor. I'm a fountain of energy. I'm joy. I'm inspired. I'm inspiring. I'm honorable. Okay, those are all great. Now, by the way, I want you to notice. I want you to notice how your identity is controlled by your state. Right now, we've been doing all this good stuff. You're in a great state, right? So all the identities you write are positive. So now, <laughs> let's try something. How many of you ever gotten pissed at yourself, angry at yourself, frustrated with yourself? Who've been in that place? Come on, let me see a show of hands out there, right? What do you say, what do you call yourself when you're pissed off at yourself, when you're frustrated at yourself, when you're in a low energy place, when it's not working? What's the identity you do then? T type it in so we'll see the difference. When you're in a lousy state, I'm an idiot, I'm a dummy, I'm, I'm a loser, right? I'm stupid, I'm, I'm filled with anger, I'm worthless, I'm stuck, I'm unmotivated, I'm disgusting, I'm an idiot, I'm a worthless piece of crap. These are really descriptive here, right? <laughs> um, what's wrong with me? I'm not enough. I'm a procrastinator, I can't do it, I'm a dunce. Some of you got tired of writing this shit and you slowed down on me here. Uh, I'm an angry one. Okay, stop. Let's, we're done with that shit, right? <laughs> but how many of you see how your story, now listen to me, your story is driven by your identity. How many see how your story and your identity is driven by your state right now? How many can see that? So put yourself, it won't be hard, put yourself in a great state. Break it up. Now type, who are you at your best? Who are you at your best? Who are you at your best? Type it in, who are you at best? Who are you at your best? Type it in there so I can see. Okay, I'm a powerful leader, I'm unstoppable, I'm light and love, I'm determined, I'm enough, I'm a magical goddess creator, I am growth, I'm a beacon of light, I am, I am Kim, I'm an inspiring leader, I'm a servant of this planet, I'm a badass businessman, I'm a problem solver, right? Now notice the totally different tone. I'm divine goddess. I'm a vessel of love and growth. I'm unstoppable, amazing, life-changing, inspirational, awesome woman. I am love, I am leader. Give it up for everybody, ladies and gentlemen. That's a whole different world, isn't it? Whoa, yes. So uh, your assignment, because I'm running out of time, part of your assignment, if you want to do it, is in the second step, write out all that who you really are but in a great state. And then if you're in business, you gotta answer this question. Why should I do business with you versus someone else? And if I had time, I'd call on somebody, but right now I'm going, I don't wanna go over any more than I'm already. So I wanna wrap this up and I got a couple more things for you that are important real fast. But if I call on somebody, inevitably they'll say, well, why should I do business with you? And they'll go, well, I give really good service. Well, everybody says that, <laughs> right? So you gotta say, what, what's unique about you? What, what's unique about how you're going to deal with me? What's unique about how you're going to interact with me? Why? Because the why is the most important thing, isn't it? How many would agree with me on this? Say I. <laughs> Let's go to the third step of building identity here real quick. Third step here. You got it. Once you write this down and refine it, it won't be perfect. Don't wait till you're perfect. Step three is you got to start to practice communicating it. So when you write it down, you, it's like writing a mission statement or something. You know, don't make it too long. Just core simple things. But you got to practice 
practice communicating, saying, you know, here's why you should do business with me. And then afterwards, say to the person, did that, was that inspiring to you? Did that make you want to do business? Let them tell you the truth. And I'll, I'll go, honestly, no. <laughs> well, help me understand. What are you looking for? And you can refine what you're doing. So you got to practice. And then step four, really important throw up the screen there, you got to live it. You, you, you can't say, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be this incredible, you know, driving athlete, health nut, and then, you know, you're going to spend four weeks sitting in your chair hanging over your computer for five hours a day and not take a break and work out, right? You got to live it. Living it will define your brand, right? People are going to judge you by what you do long term, not just in a moment. What you do consistently, and you're going to judge yourself by what you do consistently, so live it. And then step five is you got to market it. You got to, you got to get out who you are. Because if you know who you are, no one else does. Now, that doesn't mean going around bragging and stuff. But if you do things, people are going to judge you by what you do. So I'll give you a real fast example. When I was, I think I was 18 or 19 years old, I was just starting in my speaking career. And I spoke to a lot of real estate offices, a lot of stock brokerage offices. And I'd go in and I'd tell them about Jim Rohn. I'd, I'd do a mini seminar for them for about 45 minutes. And then I'd say, come here, the guy behind all this. And I get him to go to Jim Rohn's, you know, three and a half, four hour seminar. And that was my whole goal. And so I met all kinds of people and I enjoyed what I was doing. And one day I was in LA, Los Angeles, and I was in the San Fernando Valley at this place. And I saw this guy delivering these uh, to the real estate office. He was picking up so he could deliver these little booklets that people had of all the houses for sale. You know, today, usually that's done online. But in those days, uh, you know, people have what they call a farm in real estate, an area that they kind of mine for business. And he was only 17, so it wasn't legal to be a realtor yet. He wanted to be a realtor. So he literally would take this on his bike, and he would go deliver these on the farm for one of the realtors there. And he was just really enthusiastic. His name was Mike Glickman. And I, got, I started up a conversation with him. And I found out he really wanted to be a realtor more than anything else. He wasn't legal yet. He'd do it within a year. He was doing this so he could start to learn the business. And so he and I ended up bumping into each other on a regular basis, became friendly. And sure enough, at one point, when he was 18, he becomes a realtor. In his first year in business, I don't remember because it's been almost 40 years since they had this conversation, but I think he, he spent either eight months or nine months and didn't make one sale. And he was super enthusiastic and loved real estate. But the problem was he, looks, he was so young and looked so young. People were like, oh, I, I got to go with a more mature person. Someone's got more experience, right? And so he was really frustrated. And so he was stuck with this identity, I'm the kid, I don't have enough experience. And so I said to him, because I was already studying even for myself, I'm a young person, I had the same thing, it's like, what you gotta do is produce results for people. If you can produce some results for people where they see who you really are, they won't judge you by your age. And I said, that's what I've begun to do. When I can wipe out a phobia in an hour, they don't give a damn how old I am anymore. Right, but I had to produce these challenges where I would challenge psychiatrists and psychologists. By the way, now I train them. But in those days, I was trying to prove myself, you know. So it was a good strategy. And so the bottom line is, I found myself in a position where I said to him, "Think of something you could do for your community. You don't have to build an identity. The whole world knows you. You just need your farm, these 15 or 12 streets, or whatever it is that he was trying to, you know, make his farm, the area he would market to." And I said, think of something you can do for the community that's real and legitimate and that makes a difference. And, and do that. And do more than one thing if you can. And you'll build a reputation. And people will think of you differently than just this 18-year-old kid. And so we had this conversation. And I think probably four or five, six months went by. I think he had to do some other jobs, too, just to stay alive. He was making no sales. And then one day he said to me, I think I got an, a possible solution about what I could do for my community. And I said, what is it? He goes, well, there's this trash strike that's happening in the San Fernando Valley. He worked in a place called Encino, California, which is upscale homes, right? You know, not super wealthy, but, you know, relatively wealthy homes. And he goes, the trash strike's been going on for like three weeks. And if you drive through the community, there's trash everywhere because they haven't picked it up. And dogs have gotten into it. And there's some places where there's some rats that have gone there. And it's a super upscale community and it smells and it's horrible. And he said, and no one's doing anything. And every day I turn on the TV and they say day 27 of the trash strike. He says, so I thought, you know, Tony, what if, what if I went and I hired a private garbage company, just come and take all the garbage off the streets that I work and just haul all the stuff away and then tell people or collect some money from them? I said, don't collect any money from them and don't tell them. I said, what? I said, just 
have the stuff hauled away. He goes, well, it's going to be pretty expensive. I don't remember the number. My memory may be off, but I think it was like $4,000, which for him in those days would be like $400,000, a pretty big, big bet. I said, you build your identity by who you are and what you do. They don't know who you are until they see what you do. And I said, it's the right thing to do. I said, I know it seems like a huge investment, but you'll make way more than that in, in one good commission. And so sure enough, he had the guts to go do it. I really honor him for doing it. So he hires this trash company. They come and take all the trash. Now imagine you live in this community, really upscale, wealthy community, and every day you come home and it smells and there's trash everywhere and dogs in the street and everything else and you're so pissed off. And every day you turn on the TV, we're on day 28 of the trash strike and you come home and there's no trash. And you think, oh my God, this is fantastic. Thank God the trash strike's over. Oh my God, my community's back. And you turn on the news that night and they go, day 31 of the trash strike continues with no room in sight, no solution in sight. And people are like, who stole my trash? <laughs> right? <laughs> Where'd my trash go? <laughs> and everyone wanna know where their trash went. And so sure enough, like people, st- and I said, don't tell anybody, it'll get out naturally. Sure enough, somebody figured out who it was and called them up on the phone and said, listen, you're the person who took this trash out, aren't you? And he goes, no, you know, the company did it, but yeah, I paid for it. He goes, listen, I wanna pay my percentage. And he was smart. He said, absolutely not. There's no way. I just did this for the community. Well, why the hell would you do that? Well, I work in this community. I'm a realtor in this community. I know that this is bothering everybody. It's hurting home sales. It's hurting everybody's quality of life. So I just thought it was the right thing to do. And the guy says to him, well, what can I do for you? He goes, I don't want your money. He goes, but if you ever want to sell your house, or if you know someone wants to sell or buy a house in this community, please think of me. You got my number now. Well, guess what? Boom. That person told a person, told a person. The entire community is calling this guy up, thanking him, telling him, oh, you're unbelievable, Mike. Mike, in the next three years, got to the point where only one other home was sold in the entire community by any other realtor. He got them all. He made more than a million dollars in commissions and went on to start his own real estate company, Mike Glickman. He's still in the business today. Give it up for him. So you don't need a $10 billion ad campaign. Just think, it's my boss. How do I make my boss have this? If it's your own company, you want a brand with your own employees. Like, who are you? What do you do for them? Like, step into it. Make the tough decisions that are in their benefit and the benefit of the company at the same time. You will build an identity. And by the way, well, maybe we'll talk about this another day. There's another way to do it, which is called jackpots, but I think I'll save that for there because I've gone over on my time. So here's what I want you to do. How many of you are utterly convinced identity and brand are the most important things for changing your life long-term here? Make some noise. Then here's what I'm gonna ask you to do. I'm gonna ask you to go online and you're gonna go hashtag identity challenge, hashtag identity challenge, and I want you to answer three questions. What's your old identity? What was the old way you've described yourself when you're really not doing well, when you couldn't get through in a relationship, when you weren't getting through with your kids, when your body's not where you wanna be? and what your new identity can now be.